Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Your address was indeed a treasure trove of wisdom garnered and gathered through experience and wide reading. With this, I request the Honorable Chief Justice, Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachur, to present a memento to our esteemed Chief Guest. It is time now to hear our chief guest for the day, Her Excellency, Ms. Hilary Charlesworth, whose exceptional body of work in the areas of international human rights and international humanitarian law, feminist legal theory, and gender equality has not only shaped the academic discourse, but also shed light on the complexities and nuances of myriad forms of discrimination. Through her work, she has challenged the deeply ingrained societal norms and highlighted the urgent need for transformational change by dismantling oppressive structures. Through her work, she has opened places of inclusivity and empowerment. With this, I request our erudite chief guest to kindly address this August gathering who are so eager to hear from her. Chief Justice, Attorney General, Solicitor General, very distinguished former and present judges of the Supreme Court and of judges from across India, dear guests, dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends. Ma bohut hi kush hi kush. Ma bohut hi kush hu ki aaj muhe yaha amavrit kia gaya hai. <laughs> it's indeed a really great honor to have been invited to deliver this second lecture to celebrate, to mark the anniversary of the foundation of the Supreme Court of India. And I'm very conscious that this is the launch of the 75th anniversary year. And I'm very, very grateful to the Chief Justice, Dhananjay Chandra Chud, for the invitation. As he's already told you, uh, we met 40 years ago as students at Harvard Law School, and I still recall us nervously sitting together in Professor Tribe's course on American constitutional law, and we were both terrified that he would call on us impromptu, and uh, uh, this was a very bonding experience, but we spent these wonderful uh, years at Harvard together exploring all the richness of that wonderful institution. So you will not be surprised that the Chief Justice stood out even then as an absolutely brilliant, but also for me more important, a very generous person. And allow me to say that my family and I have deeply valued our friendship with him and his family over the years, and we hope it will continue to the next generations. Allow me also at the start to thank the staff of the court and the registry for graciously making all the arrangements for my visit. As you can tell, perhaps, I've long had a fascination with India after studying Indian art and history at university. And then as a student, as you've heard, I, I did spend a year uh, teaching, you'll be perhaps a bit shocked to hear, geography and hockey, of all things, at Mayo College in Ajmer. But exploring India that first year, that was my first visit, and I was here that year and had a chance to travel a lot, was really a profoundly life-changing experience for me and I've visited a number of times since and I have to say it's just wonderful to be back here in this vibrant country. I, I have been wondering since I received this invitation what thoughts I can offer this very distinguished audience and I, I did have the good fortune of reading last year's speech by the Chief Justice of Singapore and noting that he was able to draw on his long experience to distill lessons for fellow members of the judiciary. So I hope, given that I can't give you many lessons from my long career as a judge, 
that instead it might be of interest if I gave you a picture of the world of uh, international judicial institutions, particularly focusing on the one that I joined just two years ago. I, I know, of course, that over the years, the Supreme Court of India has manifested an interest in the work of the International Court of Justice. Unlike many other constitutions, the, Australian, the Indian Constitution acknowledges the role of international law in uh, Article 51, part of the Directive Principles of State Policy. And uh, the Supreme Court of India has, of course, regularly referred to international law and indeed on occasions to decisions of the International Court of Justice. Indeed, I've been struck uh, that it appears much more open to invoking international law than other apex courts, such as my own, uh, the High Court of Australia or the United States Supreme Court. But what I, I would like to do today is to start with describing the history and structure of the International Court of Justice. And then I, I want to discuss how it navigates its role as a legal institution in deeply divided political environments that implicate questions of judicial independence. Of course, the International Court of Justice's structure and jurisdiction are quite different to those of a national court, such as the Supreme Court of India, but I hope that you will find nevertheless that some of our experiences resonate with you. Well, the origins of the court, and this is our, our modern court building today, uh, date back to the early part of the 20th century and you can see here an image of the Hague Peace Conference of the participants at the Hague Peace Conference of 1899 gathered on the steps of what's now the royal residence, the House Ten Bosch, just outside the Hague. So there were two Hague Peace Conferences, 1899 and 1907, both are strikingly initiated by Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. And those two conferences together resulted in the establishment of an institutional structure for international arbitration. And this is the permanent court of arbitration, which is still going strong today. Uh, but an arbitral court is not a judicial institution. And there were moves in the early 20th century to create an international judicial tribunal. But these uh, ideas only came to fruition after the First World War. And indeed, the covenant of the League of Nations of 1919 precisely envisaged the establishment of what was called the Permanent Court of International Justice. And this permanent court was housed in the same building, the Peace Palace, or uh, in The Hague. And I've, I've got, this is a picture here of the uh, inauguration of that building. And perhaps in the front with the white beard, you can see the funder of the Peace Palace, the Scottish-American philanthropist Andrew Carnegie uh, on the opening day. So the first occupant was uh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, but it was then forced to provide half of the building for the Permanent Court of International Justice. So the Permanent Court was inaugurated in 1922, and indeed in that year it dealt with three requests for advisory opinions that had come from the Council of the League of Nations. In its life, between 1923 and 1940, the Permanent Court delivered judgments in 29 cases uh, between states, and it rendered 27 advisory opinions. And its last public sitting was in 1939, just after the outbreak of the Second World War. And this is an image of the formerly the last meeting of the Permanent Court of International Justice, which took place because of the war, because of that time, of course, the Netherlands was occupied. Uh, this is the image of the court, as it were, disbanding itself in 1945. I should say some of those judges immediately became judges of the successor court, the International Court of Justice. So the new court, the International Court of Justice, which was established under the Charter of the United Nations, had, we inherited a statute almost identical to that of the permanent court and adopted remarkably similar rules of procedure. And even today, uh, our court operates under rules of procedure, many of which uh, were first devised in 1922. Uh, the International Court, however, distinct from the Permanent Court of International Justice, was elevated to the status of a principal organ of the United Nations, uh, institutionally on the same level as the UN Security Council and the General Assembly. Well, as for our structure, 
that this, I should say, this is the first, this is the opening of the International Court of Justice, the first hearing, and perhaps in the front row of the audience you can see the then young uh, Crown Princess Juliana of the Netherlands, who went on to be, uh, of course, a long-standing Queen of the Netherlands. And you can see the, the inaugural judges gathered round the, um, gathered round the, the table there. Well, this is the latest, what we call the family photo. I should say that the court, uh, we had a new composition starting just on Tuesday. So this is the court in its composition as of last Monday. But as of Tuesday, of course, we, we lost four of our colleagues, including our, our president, Judge Joan Donahue, and our vice president, Judge Kirill Gavorgin. But this shows you uh, the, the one photo I could find of all the judges, uh, all the old composition of the court uh, together. So the court is composed of 15 judges who are required to be of different nationalities. And judges are elected by the United Nations General Assembly and the United Nations Security Council voting simultaneously. And judges are elected for nine year terms which are renewable. The court's statute, and I quote from it, mandates representation of the main forms of civilization and of the principal legal systems of the world in the court as a whole. And how that's translated in practice is that requirement is observed in an informal regional allocation of the 15 seats. There has also been a tradition that the five permanent members of the Security Council always have a national on the court. This was so until six years ago uh, when uh, the United Kingdom famously, I think I don't need to remind the yeah, Indians, uh, lost its, its seat on the court and in the most recent judicial elections in November last year, uh, Russia, as it were, lost its, its seat on the court. So there are three now, three permanent members of the Security Council uh, still have judges on the court. So we can't really refer to that as a long-standing tradition anymore. The statute doesn't refer to gender representation, unlike, for example, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And I think overall the International Court of Justice has a poor record uh, in attention to gender balance. In almost eight decades, just six women have been elected to the court, while 109 men have been elected at the same time. Today, uh, with uh, our President Joan Donahue has been uh, the new American judge, uh, Professor Sarah Cleveland has joined us, so uh, we are still four women and 11 men. Uh, you will be aware that a former member of the Supreme Court of India, Judge Dalvia Bandari, we, we call him judge at the court, I'm aware that he would be justice here, but he's Judge Bandari at the moment is a current member of the court. Other distinguished judges from India include B.N. Rao, one of the architects, I need not tell you, of the Indian Constitution. He was elected to the court in late 1951, but sadly died uh, before he even completed two years in office. Uh, perhaps the longest serving I Indian jurist that we've had on the court is Judge Nagendra Singh, who sat on the court for 15 years uh, in the 1970s and 80s. And he also served as the court's vice president and then president. And as president, he presided over perhaps one of the most significant cases in the court's history, the Nicaragua case, and I'll, I'll come back to that case. Um, every day I walk past this statue of uh, Nagendra Singh, Judge Nagendra Singh, because if you're president at the court, you're allowed to choose either a sculpture or a portrait. And so uh, the sculptures are displayed in the judge's wings. So I, I feel, although of course I never knew him, but I feel um, I see uh, Judge Nagendra Singh uh, every day with this uh, splendid, splendid bronze portrait. Another Indian judge on the court, uh, Raghunandan Swarup Patak, who was uh, appointed when he, uh, he was elected to the court when he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he finished Nagendra Singh uh, after uh, Nagendra Singh's death in 1988. The court invariably sits with all of its 15 members. Uh, the statute of the court, it's true, contemplates the formation of specialist chambers to hear particular cases. But that course has, surprising to me, it's been very, very rarely invoked. It's at the discretion of parties to call on the court to constitute a smaller bench. So almost invariably, we sit in the composition of all 15 judges. 
if there's no judge of the nationality of a state party to a dispute on the bench, that state may appoint a judge ad hoc for that case. So in some cases, we have 16 or even 17 judges. In three out of the six cases involving India during the court's eight decades, there was no Indian judge already on the bench, and so various distinguished Indian jurists were appointed as judges ad hoc. So one was uh, the former Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, M.C. Chagla, who was ad hoc judge in the rights of passage case, uh, the case uh, brought by Portugal against India in the late 1950s. Uh, judge Nagendra Singh, uh, he was also, before his election to the bench, he served as judge ad hoc in a case India brought against Pakistan relating to the jurisdiction of the KO Council. And Supreme Court Justice B.P. Jeevan Reddy was uh, appointed ad hoc judge in a case that Pakistan brought against India, the aerial incident of the 10th of August, 1999. So that's the membership of the court. What about jurisdiction? In its contentious jurisdiction, the court deals only with disputes between states. So unlike the International Criminal Court, uh, we never see individuals as such in the court. They are never... Uh, before us as individuals in the court. All 193 members of the United Nations are automatically parties to the court statute, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they accept the court's jurisdiction. There was some discussion whether the court should have compulsory jurisdiction during the drafting of the UN Charter at the San Francisco Conference in 1945. And that position, the court having compulsory jurisdiction, was certainly a champion by smaller states, such as Australia and New Zealand. But ultimately, the view of the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom prevailed, and that was that jurisdiction should be voluntary, and that's the situation today. So there are three distinct ways by which cases can come before the court. First of all, it's possible for states to enter into a special agreement to submit a dispute to the court. And we have a nice example of one such case currently on our docket, and this is where the Caribbean coast neighbours of uh, Guatemala and Belize have agreed to submit a territorial dispute to the court. So that's one route, and that's in fact the easiest route because one knows there will be no challenges to jurisdiction or admissibility. But a second route is when both states are parties to a treaty that grants the court jurisdiction to decide disputes between treaty parties. And uh, examples of such treaties that have such a jurisdictional clause include the Genocide Convention, and of course it was precisely Article 9 of the Genocide Convention that was invoked by South Africa in its recent case against Israel. Uh, there is the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination that also has a jurisdictional clause. Uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention Against Torture. So the court at the moment has a number of cases that are based on such clauses. There are two brought against Russia by Ukraine uh, on the basis of a range of different treaties. Uh, there's a well-known case that the Gambia has brought against Myanmar on the basis of the Genocide Convention. Uh, there are cases between Armenia and Azerbaijan each country has got cases against each other based on the Racial Discrimination Convention and a case brought by Canada and the Netherlands against Syria based on the Convention Against Torture. So that's the second method, jurisdictional clauses in treaties. But a third method by which states manifest consent is by making a standing declaration accepting the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. So just over a third of the 193 members of the United Nations have done this. And uh, Australia, my country of nationality, has, and India, of course, also has accepted the court's compulsory jurisdiction right since the inception of the court. Uh, I do note, however, that no other member of the BRICS uh, grouping has done so. And strikingly, only one of the permanent members of the Security Council, the United, Nation, the United Kingdom, has such a declaration in force. The most recent declaration comes from Canada in August 2023. Many of these declarations, however, are accompanied by broad reservations which constrain the court's jurisdiction. So to give you an example, uh, Australia's current declaration excludes inter alia all maritime delimitation disputes. And 
for its part, the Indian Declaration, which was revised in 2019, excludes 11 categories of dispute, including disputes with states that are or have been members of the Commonwealth, and also, and I'm quoting, disputes in regard to matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisprudence of the Republic of India, end of quote. Like the Permanent Court of International Justice, the International Court also has an advisory jurisdiction whereby certain UN organs can request advice and the critical words in the Charter are on any legal question. And this image is an image of the Chagos Archipelago and this represents the most recent advisory opinion rendered by the court on the status of the Chago Archipelago in 2018. I, I found in the archives, this is another, it's a historic photo, but it shows Naj Judge uh, Nagendra Singh sitting, as I look at that, so he's, he's, you can see the registrar sitting at the right of the bench, and then Judge Singh is two judges in, but this is an image of the International Court hearing uh, the court's arguments in the very famous advisory opinion case on the Western Sahara in 1971. Uh, in its 78 years then, uh, the International Court has considered 182 contentious cases and delivered 27 advisory opinions. What of enforcement? Unlike in international, some other international or some domestic courts, uh, the International Court of Justice is not involved in the implementation or the enforcement of its decisions, uh, even its binding judgments. So once the court delivers its judgment, the court's work is considered done. So the enforcement of the court's decisions falls on states themselves, first and foremost, the state's parties to the case. The United Nations Charter includes an undertaking by all UN members, and I quote here from Article 94, an undertaking to comply with the decision of the International Court of Justice in any case to which it is a party. And Article 94 goes on to provide that a party to a case who's dissatisfied with another party's performance of its obligations under a judgment can have recourse to the Security Council. And the Security Council, under the same article, is given the power, and I quote from it, to make recommendations or decide upon measures to be taken to give effect to the judgment. However, what's striking in, we're looking now at eight decades, the Security Council has never exercised those powers that it, it, it has. Now, how can we explain this? Of course, the use of a veto by one of the five permanent members of Security Council can really effectively stymie that route of enforcement. Indeed, in one case, the United States used its veto power to block any action by the Security Council with respect to the enforcement of a judgment against it. This was uh, the case uh, that you'll hear me refer to a few times, the case between the United States and Nicaragua. In the end, the implementation of that judgment, which was delivered in 1986, uh, really was resolved by a broader negotiations package many years later between the two states. So the means and modalities for compliance can vary and depend on the nature of the case and they can involve the assistance of regional or international organisations, including the United Nations. So one example of this is the implementation of the court's decision in an interesting case uh, which resolved a dispute, a land and maritime boundary dispute between Cameroon and Nigeria. So the court gave its decision in 2002 and then there was a lot of dispute between the two countries because there were many resource issues riding on this um, about how actually to implement the court's judgment. And uh, the Secretary General uh, recommended, using his good officer's function, recommended that the two states establish a commission for the implementation of the judgment. And this commission, and here is an example of the commission in action uh, looking at a boundary marker. This is from the commission's own website. And uh, this commission, which is made up of experts from both of the two countries, is chaired by a special representative of the Secretary General, and it also has several of its own subcommissions and working groups. And each year, the Secretary General uh, makes a report to the Security Council on the commission's progress. So it's on the Secretary General, the Security Council's agenda every year. 
but uh, it is slowly, if one follows the reports, we can see it's slowly, the judgment is slowly being implemented um, with the emphasis perhaps on the word slow, but at least, at least it's being implemented peacefully. Other judgments are more straightforward and states are generally willing to implement them. I think no state welcomes being found to have acted in violation of international law. For example, almost two years ago to the day, the court awarded 325 million United States dollars compensation in favor of the Democratic Republic of the Congo for damages caused by Uganda in the context of an armed conflict that involved significant violations of human rights law and the laws of war at the turn of our most recent century. But it's at least reported in the press that Uganda has been complying with the judgment by paying the compensation due in installments as proposed by the court. So it seems that uh, despite the limited apparatus of enforcement of the court's decisions, they nevertheless often have considerable influence on state behavior. And in many ways, the legitimacy of the court's pronouncements depend on the uh, confidence that the members of its international constituency, states and international organizations, the confidence they have in it uh, which in turn turns on its, the persuasive force of its reasoning. I must acknowledge that there have been some very lean periods in the court's life. And the longest lean period, I think, perhaps was the period after the delivery of the judgment in the Southwest Africa case in 1966. <clears throat> and this is an image of the case being argued uh, before the court. <clears throat> the court, after it heard uh, the hearing, it had 16 judges in, in that case. There was an ad hoc judge. Um, the court was evenly divided on the question whether Ethiopia and Liberia, two members, African members of the League of Nations, did those two states have standing to challenge South Africa's performance of its duties as mandatory power over Southwest Africa or modern day Namibia? Uh, the, those two states, Ethiopia and Liberia, argue that South Africa's extension of its policy of apartheid to Southwest Africa was inconsistent with the terms of the League of Nations mandate over the territory. So because uh, there were 16 judges and the vote was 8-8, so the vote was split and under our rules of court, the president of the court, who's represented here, in fact, uh, this is Sir Percy Spender, uh, the first Australian elected to the court and the only Australian uh, president of the court. Here he is announcing the court's decision and he cast his casting vote against Ethiopia and Liberia's standing. <clears throat> Many of the new members of the United Nations from the developing world were dismayed by this decision and lost trust in the court as a useful forum for dispute resolution. That distrust was deep and it lingered for 20 years really until the court's 1986 decision in Nicaragua against the United States. And that, the Nicaragua case, as I've mentioned, was actually decided under the presidency of Judge Nagendra Singh. Today, despite that low point uh, in the court's history in the 20 years when there was barely a case on the court's docket and some judges found themselves becoming elected to the court and simply never hearing a case on the court because there was such loss of faith in the court. But we are at one of the busiest points ever. After just speaking beforehand to the Chief Justice, I'm embarrassed to tell you about the size of our docket after hearing about the size of the docket of the Supreme Court. Uh, but this is the biggest uh, docket ever. Uh, we have 18 contentious cases from every region of the globe. The cases uh, range from land and maritime boundary disputes to, as I've mentioned, allegations of race discrimination and genocide. We received last year two requests for advisory opinions from the United Nations General Assembly, one on the legal consequences <coughs> excuse me, of, <coughs> of Israel's policies and practices in the occupied Palestinian territory, and we're just about to begin hearings in that case. And the second one was on the international legal obligations in relation to climate change. And then in September, the International Labour Organization requested from the court an urgent advisory opinion on whether one of its conventions enshrines the right to strike. So for the court, this is a historic number of cases to have on its docket at one time. 
and it does suggest at the international level that the court has a groundswell of respect and authority in the international community. Perhaps paradoxically, deep international political divisions that have hampered diplomacy in the work of the Security Council appear to have made the court more appealing as a forum for dispute resolution. And yet, despite this apparent success, the court has also attracted a great deal of criticism over the years. One strand of criticism that I'll, I'll focus on now is that international law operates in an intensely political context and that its principles are more the product of politics than true law. On this argument, international judges are often taken out of the purely legal realm and they're called on to make political decisions. This criticism isn't peculiar, of course, to international law. In several domestic jurisdictions, including Australia, it's sometimes argued that the courts, especially the appellate courts, should keep at arm's length a category of questions that are incapable of legal decision, questions that are deemed non-justiciable. Then, as now, uh, international adjudication has always been premised on the consent of sovereign states. Thank you. Thank you very much. Agreeing to submit their disputes to a third party arbiter. So the argument in international law runs that some disputes are politically sensitive and the disputes touching on the vital interests, or sometimes it's called the honour of the state, are simply too important to be left in the hands of international judges. So the idea is that the role for courts such as the International Court, uh, that they should simply occupy themselves with technical cases such as land and maritime boundary disputes. But what's technical and what's an issue of policy? The inherently subjective, if not self-judging character of that sort of argument is evident. But beyond that, the argument rests on a purported distinction between the realm of politics and the realm of law. Politics and law are not different provinces of social organisation. Rather, I see them as different lenses through which to observe social experience. And so every relationship, including every conflict between states, can be approached through a legal perspective, much as every relationship and conflict between individuals can. As with relationships between individuals, it may be more or less useful to approach a given relationship between states through a legal lens, but that doesn't make it impossible nor inevitably futile. Of course, this isn't to say that law can provide the only angle on a relationship or a conflict. Being one of multiple lenses, law will hardly ever offer a perfect image, but it provides an important thread in a fabric of regulation that can be woven with threads of politics, economy, history, public opinion and culture to influence behaviour. In its practice, the International Court has affirmed that it may indeed, it must decide the legal aspects of the disputes that are properly submitted to it. And it has held that any dispute framed in legal terms is essentially a legal dispute. <coughs> The court articulated that idea unequivocally for the first time in a case arising in the wake of the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and uh, in the siege of the US Embassy in Tehran. So with its nationals still taken hostage, the United States resorted to the court, complaining that Iran was breaching the inviolability of diplomatic premises and the immunity of diplomatic and consular staff. Iran responded in turn that this act should be seen against the United States decade-long interventionist policy in Iran's domestic affairs. So even though the relations between the two states were extremely tense, the court did not shy away from this dispute and it held that its constitutive instruments did not contemplate, and I quote from the court's judgment, decline to take cognizance of one aspect of the dispute merely because that dispute has other aspects, however important, end of quote. Of course, sometimes uh, that decision has been explained as simply a political move by a Western-leaning court, then presided over by a British judge. After all, it said this was the same court that had fairly recently decided uh, not to grant Ethiopia and Liberia standing in the South West Africa case. Yet, it was not long after the case by the United States against Iran 
that the court applied exactly the same principle against the United States itself. Uh, the Caribbean country, the Central American country of Nicaragua, bought a case in 1984 against the United States, complaining about its interventionist policies, um, its uh, funding of, of uh, guerrilla groups and so on uh, in that country. And uh, the United States, when it was brought by the court before, uh, it, before it, uh, the United States made the argument that uh, the court should not rule on this case. It's intensely, it's a case that's susceptible only to political resolution. It's one that's not susceptible to legal resolution. And indeed, the United States argued it would be counterproductive to the political resolution of the dispute between the parties if the court gave an opinion in the matter. Well, the court gave very short shrift to the United States argument, acting consistently with its uh, decision. And here is uh, Judge Nagendra Singh uh, presiding in that case. And uh, the court said that its role was to decide legal questions, even if they form part of a broader political dispute. In 2017, India found itself in a situation comparable to that of the United States in its case against Iran, or Nicaragua in its case against the United States. Uh, Kulbushan Sudhir Jadav, an Indian national, uh, had been sentenced to death by a Pakistani military court on counts of espionage and terrorism. So here is a, a picture of the Indian team uh, in the Great Hall of Justice. And India relied on the same convention that the United States had in its case against Iran, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Um, and, uh, India claimed that Mr. Jadav was denied his right to consular assistance by its state of nationality, and the court uh, certainly agreed with that argument. Now, of course, it, it's obvious that the court's judgment didn't resolve all tensions between India and Pakistan, but at least it provided a resolution, a legal resolution, to an acute problem dividing them. So let me then uh, move on to independence of judges. The political context in which the International Court of Justice inevitably operates, because we're the United Nations primary judicial body, this gives rise to a second form of criticism that uh, relates to the independence of judges. Popular commentary on the court, and here you can see, this is a photo actually of the court taken just last Monday as uh, we were swearing, uh, the, the, our new colleagues were making a, uh, their declarations, their solemn declarations, and temporarily the president of the court was the most senior judge on the court, Judge Peter Tomka, uh, who is in his third term on the court. Judge Tomka is from Slovakia. So that's, that's, that's the court, um, as, as I say, in its, its new composition. But there's, there's a lot of uh, commentary on the court that often presents it, especially in the popular media, as an almost entirely political organ whose members effectively represent the interests of their states of nationality. The nationally and legally heterogeneous backgrounds of the judges are assumed to make judicial consensus unlikely. And in this respect, many commentators contrast the ICJ unfavorably with national courts, which are taken to represent the acme of the judicial function. On this analysis, the international court has at best the carapace of a court, offering, however, a highly restricted form of judicial independence. So I cite as an example the American academic Eric Posner, writing in 2006, and uh, he concluded in a famous article on the topic that uh, the International Court of Justice was basically lost because it could ne neither please the major powers, which resisted any constraint on their actions, nor could it maintain the loyalty of smaller powers, which in his words regarded the court as a puppet of the major powers. Well, uh, Eric Posner and other scholars have studied the voting behavior of international judges, focusing on the extent of their independence from the state that nominated them and drawing very pessimistic conclusions, basically saying uh, judges will always vote in favor of the interests of the state of their state of nationality. The decision in the Nicaragua case uh, in 1986, it's very interesting in the literature, as soon as that case appeared, there was a flurry of claims by mainly United States lawyers, academics, that the members of the International Court weren't independent. And uh, promptly, 
before the court went on to hear the merits of the Nicaragua case, the United States withdrew its statement of jurisdiction. So, and it said, well, the reason why the United States has done so is because the court essentially is not composed of independent judges. <clears throat> Such scholars have gone on to explain the reluctance of some states to appear, for your, be, to appear before the court as based on a lack of trust in an international judiciary to apply the law impartially, assuming always that the judge is going to vote in favor of positions that promote the interest of their home states or that reflect their own cultural prejudices. So the question of judicial independence is one that confronts all courts and is vital to their legitimacy. It is of, of acute importance in a global era of democratic decay and growing autocracy. And I, I was very struck by the fact that Chief Justice Chandra Chud emphasized the centrality of judicial independence in his wonderful address that he gave at the ceremonial sitting of the court uh, just two weeks ago. But what does uh, in judicial independence mean in an international context? And what I struck in preparing for this talk is how little reflection there is on this question in the scholarly literature. So students of international law, this will be a wonderful question for a PhD thesis. The court statute describes the court, and I quote, as a body of independent judges elected regardless of their nationality from among persons of high moral character and legal competence. And the new judges, and you can see them actually standing to make their solemn declarations in this photo, uh, they, the solemn declaration is one to perform their duties and exercise their powers as judge. The four words are honorably, faithfully, impartially, and, impartially, and conscientiously. And so there are several provisions in the court's institutional framework that seek to preserve the impartiality of judges. That is, their absence of bias in favor of one party. So, for example, the court statute forbids judges to participate in cases in which they've previously been involved in a different capacity, such as counsel for one of the parties. On occasion, this principle has been applied very rigor rigorously. For example, uh, B.N. Rao, uh, the distinguished uh, Indian jurist who I mentioned earlier, was the Indian ambassador in the Security Council at the time it was called on by the United Kingdom to consider whether Iran was failing to comply with an interim injunction or a provisional measure that the court had issued in a pending case between the UK and Iraq. When B.N. Rao then was elected to the court shortly afterwards in 1951, he decided himself that he should not participate in the court's deliberations in subsequent phases of the case between the two countries. So he clearly had a, a very high standard there of, of um, impartiality. But I see independence as different from impartiality. It's aimed at eliminating not any preconception that judges may have, which I take to be impartiality, but rather any non-legal considerations that might affect a judge's reasoning and cloud their judgment. Independence as freedom from any source of extra legal pressure is a trait to be ensured not only by each judge individually, but also by the judicial institution as a collective. At the same time, of course, guarantees of independence must not shield judges from accountability. And that's often a, a, a fine balance. In this regard, we can see in the International Court of Justice's basic documents rules that are frequently found in domestic and international judiciaries. The incompatibility of the judicial function with any other profession, notably political or administrative functions, uh, the impossibility of removing a judge, save by a unanimous decision of the court itself, and judicial immunity. The value of other rules and practices in safeguarding judicial independence is less obvious, and it may sometimes depend on a domestic legal heritage. On this point, an international institution such as the International Court of Justice brings to the fore various and potentially diverging, indeed clashing, conceptions of independence, and it tries to accommodate them. Take, for example, the rule concerning the secrecy of deliberations and voting. It's fairly uncontroversial in most systems that judicial deliberations should be secret. But what about voting? Our court, the international court statute, is silent. To a common lawyer, it may seem obvious that the judgment could indeed should indicate the way in which each individual judge voted in the operative clause of the court's decision. 
uh, the fact that the international court statute explicitly gives judges the right to append individual opinions seems to point in the same direction. But on the other hand, it's been argued, <coughs> especially by those from a civil law tradition, that to identify the individual judges' votes not only undermines the authority of the judgment, but that it also exposes those judges to real or perceived pressure to vote in a particular way. For more than 50 years, the practice of the ICJ and its predecessor was not to indicate the way in which each judge voted. And it was only in 1978 that the court amended its rules so that now its decisions also indicate the names of the judges constituting the majority. All of these guarantees may indeed protect a judge from immediate attempts at manipulating her. But there are, of course, more subtle forms of influence. For example, there are no limits to re-election at the International Court of Justice. So a judge who's facing re-election in the near future may, theoretically, be tempted to modify her views to align them with influential elector states. For that reason, several judges, including the recently retired president of the court, Joan Donoghue, have proposed a single non-renewable term for International Court of Justice judges. She suggested in her recent address to the Sixth Committee of the General Assembly, perhaps there could be a, simple term, a single term of perhaps 12 rather than nine years. Non-renewable terms are already the rule in various other international courts, and they've been recommended by the Institute of International Law, the oldest learned society of international law. Such a reform would, of course, require amendment of the court's statute, which is not in the hands of the court itself. Nonetheless, the court has adopted a series of decisions as well as some informal practices that set limits to the invitations or decorations that judges may receive and to their participation in external activities, in arbitrations and so on. Uh, to conclude then, assertions of lack of independence are regularly made about judges who staff international, international judicial institutions such as the International Court of Justice. Almost all disputes and requests that arrive at the court have a clear political context, and some observers are keen to question the court's ability to resolve such issues on the basis of law. And yet, uh, in my view, I think, we, the court has largely, overall, managed to adjudicate the legal aspects of politically sensitive disputes with integrity. Judicial independence is critical to the operation of legal institutions, particularly in volatile political contexts such as the international sphere. But its content is not easy to pin down. At the international level, where a diversity of judicial backgrounds is vital, Judicial independence, the idea of judicial independence, must accommodate intellectual, social, cultural, and national differences. I think it's important to develop more sophisticated accounts of judicial independence than simply tracking vote patterns, with all due respect to those who engage in that research. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers has recently identified some current challenges to judicial independence in national legal systems that I think apply also <clears throat> in, to the international level. These include, these challenges include disinformation that's spread online, online harassment and threats, and also the misuse of artificial intelligence. The Special Rapporteur also emphasizes the composition of the judiciary as a critical element of judicial independence, noting these are her words, the importance of participation in the judiciary articulated for those who commonly experience discrimination, uh, including women, members of minority groups marginalized, for example, because of their ethnicity, race, or sexuality, or persons with disabilities. I think judicial independence is a field where the international judiciary, of which I'm a member, has much to learn from the practice of national courts. Our two courts, the Supreme Court of India and the International Court of Justice, while very different, I note that we're of a very similar age. You're going into your 75th year, uh, we're going into our 78th year. We're slightly, slightly your older there, your elder there. But we both face the task of navigating highly charged political environments as legal institution. The international judiciary, I think, can draw inspiration from the Supreme Court of India's distinguished history of independence and innovation. What is also really impressive to me 
is the Supreme Court's courageous capacity for introspection, which, uh, to quote the Chief Justice's recent talk at the uh, ceremonial sitting, and I quote from him, introspection is the art of bringing the seemingly unattainable within the line of vision. This, it seems to me, is a vital quality introspection for true judicial independence. Chief Justice, let me congratulate the Supreme Court on its foundation day, on its uh, anniversary year, and I wish it a rich and rewarding future. Aap sabika bahod danyavad. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Your words are a reminder that through judicial independence, we can bend the arc of history towards a more inclusive and equitable future. We owe a debt of gratitude to you, ma'am. With this, we come to the end of the second edition of the annual lecture series of the Supreme Court of India. I would like to thank the honorable guests both on and off the dais for sparing their valuable time on a beautiful Saturday morning. With this, we conclude. I request all of you to kindly join us for lunch after this program. Thank you. Thank you very much.